Good morning, I'm Oswald San. Welcome to another edition of Family Matters brought to you by MAPS and your radio 102.9. Today we have the pleasure to have Kim uh, from the Y. Uh, of course, this is the third of our three part series with Kim, <laughs> uh, who's been uh, just an enormous fountain of information for us. So, Kim, thank you for joining us again. Uh, Thank you. As you may know, uh, over the last two shows, we have talked about uh, youth at risk. We have spoken about uh, services for women. And today, um, we want to talk about the homeless and at risk of homeless population with Kim. Kim, of course, has been with the Y for a number of years as their executive director. She's also been the ED for the Boys and Girls Club, and the Crisis Center as well. So we have a, Kim has a lot of um, experience in this year. So Kim, welcome again. And let's just start right, right in on this. Um, when when we talk about homeless or at the risk of being homeless, it, it seems like a fairly general title. What are we really ta- talking about when we talk about that group? Yeah, and I think <clears throat> often, you know, when people think of homelessness, they think of that street homeless, mm-hmm. the visual homeless. And um, homelessness is so much bigger than that. You know, unstable housing, overcrowded housing, couch surfing, you know, uh, not being able to find housing, those types of things. So homelessness is a lot larger. We talked about it a little bit uh, under youth homelessness mm-hmm. because there is a large um, population of youth that are homeless, mm-hmm. uh, primarily couch surfing or, you know, staying with friends. Um, if I was to think of one kind of word that would describe homelessness, in my opinion, it would be, you know, just lack of an unstable housing. So okay. you could be you could be housed, but it could be unstable housing. You could have 12 people in, you know, a three-bedroom apartment. That's unstable, right? right? You could be on the verge of eviction. Yes. Um, That's unstable housing. And particularly in Thompson, because there isn't a whole lot of housing available, Mm -hmm. right? Um, We have a lot of people that are in unstable situations or at risk of becoming homeless. Not to negate the fact that, obviously, street homeless is the visual kind of homeless Mm -hmm. you know um people often you know they struggle with addictions often on Mm -hmm. the street you know mental health issues but so so do people that are at risk of homelessness that's why they're at risk of homelessness yeah you know it's interesting you mentioned that because just a few weeks ago i i was dealing with one uh lady and her son who was under enormous stress because they were in an apartment uh, that the rent had just been increased uh, significantly, and she was under no stress. She was being given eviction notice. She was being, uh, you know, phone calls, and uh, there's no doubt that uh, she was just at her wit's end. So I understand, uh, especially in Thompson, where we've had a number of occasions over the years where apartments have been upgraded, and rents have been increased. Um, by you know fair margin and at times it just uh, is a lot larger than the people who are in there are able to pay um, and as a result yes they do have to find other yeah conditions. when we talk about you know the availability of housing in Thompson mm. right there is not a huge poll or a huge um, that they can draw from when we're talking about you know lower kind of lower income people or even middle income uh, mm-hmm. people, individuals mm-hmm. looking for housing. It's difficult in Thompson because you're right, lots of our stock was, you know, bought up from outside investors, mm-hmm. upgraded, and then the rent becomes unattainable. And so we don't have a whole lot of options for people. Mm-hmm. That's how we find ourselves in situations of people living in substandard housing, right. overcrowded housing. Uh, you know, people think it it doesn't exist in Thompson like you know often if I'm talking to people they talk about the outer line communities you know being in overcrowded situations you'd be surprised at how many overcrowding homes are in Thompson um, because there's a lack of housing and the other thing that plays into that we're probably already halfway through our time now but (laughs) is there's a there's a huge amount of stigma when we're dealing with 
the homeless population and trying to look at housing options for homeless because there is a stigma automatically attached to homeless people that they're you know that they're all addicts which is untrue Mm -hmm. that they all suffer from mental health which is untrue often it's just a a series of misfortunate events that have led some people to be homeless well and actually that leads leads into our next question because when we talk about the demographic profile of of groups that from what you've seen over years tends to be overrepresented in the homeless or at risk of being homeless uh what would you say that group l- looks like uh, you talked about um uh, p- people with addictions any other groups that you can state that tends to be over represented in that homeless or at risk homeless population well definitely because we've talked about it in other sessions that we have had you know definitely uh, women that are suffering from domestic violence mm-hmm. situations mm-hmm. they're overrepresented youth right even though it's kind of hidden mm. so it's and then of course you know we live in northern manitoba and and we are a primary in, uh, indigenous mm-hmm. um community mm-hmm. in the north so um you know the large a large amount of the homeless are indigenous yeah uh, you know what is going going back to to the first question when you talk about how there seems to be a uh, kind kind of a, uh, a smaller view of what a homeless population is. Uh, do you feel that due to that disconnect between um, the actual people that are at risk with the general population's view, has that seeped its way into our current policies where at times um, there's not enough um, focus on that broader issue versus just a narrow part that, you know, when it comes to homeless population, we're talking people at the homeless shelter or people that we see on the streets. Has that affected, you think, um, the access to resources? Well, I think, you know, yeah, I think the short answer is yes, but of mm. course there's a whole bunch of stuff that comes under that. There has been a huge focus on a, on the street po- you know the street homeless population because that's a visual and that's typically what the community is going to bring forth concerns about is the street homeless right um but that's not to say that we haven't done work in on other areas of people at risk of homeless uh, youth homelessness you know women women and children that become homeless and if we just think about initiatives that have taken place over the years such as transition homes mm-hmm. sitting up mm-hmm. They they aren't targeted for street homeless. They're for anyone that's homeless, right. any experience. But I do agree that you know our primary focus has been a, a lot of the the street homeless, the visual homeless, and particularly during COVID, mm-hmm. right? We we seen a, a huge amount of effort uh, kind of go into the street homeless. And you know if we talk about COVID. Uh, you know, I'm not a doctor, but I, I always think, you know, an overcrowded home mm-hmm. is much worse, worse in terms of spreading COVID than a, than a person that's on the street. Right. Right. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's interesting with the dynamics of not just Thompson, but any of the urban centers, whether it's the Paw uh, or Thompson or Flin Flon, that when we have overcrowded situations in in communities outside of these uh, urban centers uh, that's that's part of the um, um, factors that drive people into Thompson or into the PA because they don't they don't at times have the appropriate housing situation um, but when it comes to the homeless population uh, and this is just a side question do you do you feel that there's enough discussions between, say, these urban centers and some of the outlining communities to try and get their members back, um, back into their First Nation or into their uh, community, rather than having them be on the streets of Thompson? Like, well, <coughs> what's your thoughts on that? Well, I would say, you know. <laughs> There is efforts like that that have been, Mm -hmm. particularly with organizations that work directly with the homeless population, Mm -hmm. the street homeless primarily. Um, So even at the Y with our SHIP program or Mm -hmm. our transition program, 
you know, if a client identifies that they want to return home to mm-hmm. their home community, there's a lot of effort that goes into um, assisting that client to connect back to their community. So we do that quite often at the Y. I know yeah. that the the homeless shelter downtown also does that as well as 95 Cree. Right. Could it be a bigger effort? Could we be more coordinated? Absolutely. I think that we could, you know, we could get into more of the at-risk homeless or those overcrowding situations for those that want to return back to the community. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think COVID, COVID, again, not to bring the focus on to COVID, but COVID really heightened the need to have more coordinated effort, mm-hmm. right? in terms of helping people return home because what was happening at the height of COVID, the height of the third wave is people were stranded here because they needed to isolate for 14 days right. prior to going home. Yeah. Well, if you're homeless or if you live in an overcrowded house, how do you isolate for 14 days to be mm-hmm. able to return home? No, no ill to the community. I mean, they're trying to protect their community right. and it really heightened, you know, and so I'll just quickly put a plug uh, into the, you know, the local CAP, the Community Advisory Group on Homelessness. Mm. I mean, they're talking about doing a coordinated access program where everybody, all the services are on this program. And so that we're better able to connect clients to what they've identified. They want, you know, I want to return home mm-hmm. or I want to move into housing so that we're a little bit more coordinated. So that's just not scatterings amongst Thompson working. Okay, and you know what? I want to talk a little bit more about the SHIP Pro program, one of your fa- favorite topics. But before I do, I just want to remind everyone that you are listening to Family Matters, uh, brought to you by MAPS and your radio station 102.9. We have Kim Hicks, the Executive Director of the YWCA, talking to us about the uh, homeless and at-risk of homeless population. Um, Switching gears a bit to the to shift program, I believe that over the last year um, there may have been some unwarranted uh, criticism uh, of that pro program. Feeling that at times it has driven up some of the things we we see with the homeless population. Uh, can you go into details on your thoughts about how effective that program has been? Well, definitely as, you know, as an executive director of the Y and day in and day out of running this program, Mm -hmm. we're, we're actually, you know, by March, we would have been running this program for two years. It was a... Sorry, and SHIP stands for, just to make sure everyone is clear on it. Yeah, so SHIP is um, Sheltering Homeless in Place Project. Right. It was a direct COVID-19 response Mm -hmm. project. And so this was in the attempts to, you know, stop the spread of COVID mm-hmm. throughout Northern Manitoba. We, you know, that was recognized super early. So what they did was they identified, you know, 25 of the highest risk of, of contracting COVID and having some serious outcomes due to their medical conditions. So that's how it initially started. Mm-hmm. That program, you know, is is super successful. And, and when we talk about coordinating to, to, you know, assist clients to go home, they're able to do their, you know, their 14 day isolation. But you know, when I sp- <clears throat> speak to the RCMP to see, right, mm-hmm. are we actually making an impact? Mm-hmm. And the amount of calls for RCMP, ambulance services, or even those clients going to the hospital to, to get service right. um, has significantly decreased because right. they have somewhere to be that's safe that's warm, Mm -hmm. Uh, they have their dignity, they're humanized, right? And often I find that we dehumanize homelessness and not look at them as a person, as an individual. What's their journey? What's their story? Why are they in Thompson? Why wouldn't we dig a little deeper and have those conversations? It has been criticized. Definitely SHIP Mm -hmm. has been criticized. You know, there are certain measures that we had to take in terms of COVID Mm -hmm. to try to encourage a more a close to home approach as as opposed to out and running around the community. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so there are certain policies that, you know, where where people will, you know, you know, question or criticize, you know, things like trying to excuse me, trying to encourage them, you know, to stay close to home. Mm-hmm. And we recognize that these are addicts. They they require they require the alcohol. Right in order to not have a significant medical 
event happen. Right. And so we try to encourage them to, you know, have the, you know, the alcohol closer to site so that they're not out running around in the community. So mm-hmm. it often appears, you know, that we have this big party happening <laughs> outside the Y, which is, which is untrue. Right. Yeah, you know what? And I, I, I thought a lot about the program. I, I, I even go as far as saying, um, even if you take COVID off the table as the driving force behind the program, what's your thoughts on that program being a bit of a model as to how going forward we should address um, people who are uh, um, addicts, for lack of a better word, that are part of that homeless or at risk of being homeless group? I definitely am a fan of ship outside mm. of COVID. Right. And, and anyone that knows me, every table that I've been at, definitely as long as you are balancing that program in terms of assisting clients with what goal they have identified, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's the housing first principles. Right. Really, at the end of the day, yeah. housing first is, is proven to be a successful model right. uh, as long as you have the support pieces in there to support clients and recognize that, you know, addiction has its ups and downs and its roller coaster and it doesn't come from a punishment place. It comes from let's work together to see what what journey we can go on to get you into housing, to get you, you know, reduce your going to the hospital, those types of things. And navigating, then, sorry, mm-hmm. sorry, Oswald, I, navigating those systems mm-hmm. are is hard enough on people that already have housing. Right. You right. go try to navigate a system when you don't have ID. Yeah. Right. You don't have nothing, so mm. ha- you can't even enter a bank to open a bank account. And and actually, that uh, the um, housing first actually uh, answers my last question in regards to what you see with with the current gaps. And we want just uh, closing. I just want to talk a little bit about uh, first of all what how housing first is. Uh, just so for for uh, our view our. Uh, our I just understand that and how you feel it it makes a mark on trying to address the homeless or at-risk homeless population. Well, it kind of turns everything upside down because mm-hmm. really primarily if we look historically when we deal with housing, mm-hmm. uh, with homeless people that are, you know, have addiction issues or mental health issues or anything like that, housing first kind of flips it because before in order to have housing, you would need to, you know, be a sober have or functioning job, yeah. yeah have a job and yeah. housing first really just looks at housing somebody regardless of what they're you know they're whether they have an addiction whether mm-hmm. they have any other issues it gives gives them housing first mm-hmm. which hence the title housing, mm-hmm. housing first and then once they have that housing mm-hmm. they feel more safe they feel more secure they develop relationships mm-hmm. and then they're able to start looking at what their journey looks like and what they want yeah. to continue with what I want to say about that is, you know, you have to have, again, I, I think I've said it in the last two sessions, we have to ensure that we have access to all different types of housing for people, uh, particularly when we talk about homeless or hidden homelessness. You know, we have to have sober living facilities, mm-hmm. it, like like maps. Mm-hmm. We have to have housing first, you know, uh, what they would call damp houses where mm-hmm. people are allowed to enter those facilities intoxicated now. To clarify, because that's been criticized in mm-hmm. the in the um, Thompson as well, it does not mean that they're drinking on site in right. their in their rooms. Right. What it means is that we recognize that we're not going to punish them for being an addict. Mm-hmm. We're not going to punish them for being intoxicated. Mm-hmm. There are standards or expectations of entering the facility if you are intoxicated. So, for instance, ship, right? Yes. If you enter the facility intoxicated, the expectation is you go directly to your room. There's no interactions with other people because mm-hmm. you're intoxicated mm-hmm. and there's other people in the building, mm-hmm. right? And so those guidelines kind of guide that housing first kind of damp house model, right? I think there's lots of confusion on what harm reduction looks like, what housing first is. There's some, you know, assumptions that that means you know, drinking in your room and mm-hmm. being in to- getting intoxicated right in your room. Yeah, and, and you know what? In in clo- closing, I would say that's probably our main challenge right now is trying to clarify um, what pro- programs are there for and what their focus is because I think there's a lot of uh, 
misinformation out there. That's why we have you on uh, on the show here to help clarify. It's been great talking to uh, to uh, to Kim here, the executive director for the Y the WCA. Uh, I would say that there's a good chance we will have, have her back again. In fact, I was trying to uh, talk to her about be, be, become my co-host for uh, Family Matters. would be great. It's, it's great having a person that has the depth of experience and knowledge that, that you do have on these various topics that are not just facing uh, Thompson, but actually Norn Manitoba. Because we, we are seeing the trend lines, right? We are seeing that, you know, these challenges are not going away. If anything, they are increasing. And we need to have proactive programs in place, I would say, with the with, with, with the SIP program. That's a, a great example of, uh, of a pro, proactive program that I feel that um, there should be some good lobbying to keep that in place even after... Um, COVID, COVID, because I totally agree. Um, you know, it is in line with, um, I know if so some of our uh, audience members, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. But, you know, when you don't have to worry about being outside and free freezing to death or starving to death, and you have those basic needs taken care of, that's when you have the opportunity to start to really think about where are you in life what do you want to be doing? Are you happy where you're at right now? And I, people, when they are under stress from trying to find a roof over their head or trying to find the next meal, uh, let's face it, they just do, do, do not go into that line of thinking. So thank you again, Kim. Appreciate your time. And I say you know, there's an open invite to have you back again. I know we will. You are listening to Family Matters, brought to you by MAPS and your radio 102.9. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And see you next time. Or hear you next time. Actually, take that.